Everyday Samurai, Episode 32. <music> Greetings, friends, and welcome to Everyday Samurai. In service to your liberty and the security of a free state, how are you? You know, we take the statement seriously about being in service to liberty and the security of a free state, The perennial question is how to actually deliver on this ideal of securing liberty and maintaining a state of freedom through law. Unfortunately, the United States and most other nations around the world have gotten accustomed to having their security provided by a bureaucratic class of tax-funded, full-time standing armies, even though they go by a variety of different names. Whether they're called self-defense forces, militaries, regulatory agencies, homeland security departments, or environmental protection agencies, when you look at it transactionally, as we should as students of political economy, you come to realize that the name really doesn't matter. It's how they're funded and how they are managed that determines their function. The founders of the United States understood that standing armies are antithetical to liberty and the security of a free state. They, therefore, designed a system of government aimed at securing justice without surrendering liberty, Because, as Benjamin Franklin rightly pointed out, when you surrender liberty in exchange for security, you wind up with neither one. Nowhere is this on greater display than in the realm of military generals and flag officers, both active and retired. Even once they leave active service, they are still a part of an elaborate mechanism built entirely for extracting resources from taxpayers. We can add to this category the civilian equivalents in the senior executive service at the helm of massive federal agencies. What is worse is that they are truly what Adam Smith called in his seminal The Wealth of Nations a man of system, conditioned over a career to act in accord with a bureaucratically managed and politically driven institution, to expect resources, privileges, and grandeur to flow to them merely from their status as military officers. Even more so, they come to expect society to be regulated as though everyone and everything were subject to similar regulation. Let's take as a case in point the recent op-ed by retired Admiral William McRaven, where he claims the president should be replaced, quote, the sooner the better, close quote. Now, McRaven at one time was someone I considered a shining star. I used to think very highly of him. In 1995, he had his master's thesis from Naval Postgraduate School published as a book on special operations case studies. Yet now he's writing op-eds claiming the president, because of the withdrawal from just a small sliver of America's ongoing foreign misadventures, somehow threatens the republic. McRaven is dead wrong, and glossing over reality with appeals to American values, the bravery of service members, or being the global good guys, cannot cover up the real threat to the American republic, posed by the permanent military establishment, of which he is a part. It is a dangerous trend to have generals and admirals that want to topple the existing political order. That is exactly how Julius Caesar became dictator of Rome. Caesar was a military general and came home from campaign to bring order to the Roman Republic through the consolidation of power, and it was all downhill from there. We can also see the fomenting of and then capitalizing upon crisis to centralize control and establish a permanent military dictatorship several times in the history of the samurai. In fact, the entire thousand years of samurai history can be characterized as a series of crisis, consolidation, and decay of dictatorial regimes. The story of the shoguns is a repeatable pattern of leading generals taking control of the political order for themselves to establish a monopoly on the use of force and decision-making. Even though it may have been done in the name of the emperor, the actual day-to-day affairs and control of resources was handled through the shogunate. So it is all about provoking disputes and then settling them to their own advantage, as Professor Hans Hermann Hoppe rightly points out in The Paradox of Imperialism. The issue then becomes one of preventing the rise of any challengers by instituting certain oaths, honor codes, ceremonial obligations, and bureaucratizing society with regulations to ensure that no other competitors would have the financial wherewithal to present challenges to their rule. In this way, the monopoly security provider insulates themselves from competition and, simultaneously, from any discipline imposed by consumers that would otherwise take their business elsewhere. 
It is for this reason that we can use the tools of political economy to diagnose this monopoly status on the use of force as the root of all evil from the standpoint of the citizenry taxed to pay for it, and from a security standpoint, it is the beginning of stagnation that leads to both greater injustice and public insecurity. This is on full display when we look at the era of the Tokugawa shogunate. To maintain control, they closed off the entire country to foreign trade with a policy of sakoku, which literally means a country in chains. They bound people into a rigid class structure and prevented social mobility, particularly restricting anyone from entering into the business of security production, all in the name of maintaining order and, as the great economist Friedrich Hayek indicated, stabilization is chaos. When it comes to social and economic matters, as an authority tries to lock people into rigid hierarchies that don't fit or meet their needs, it sets up a collision course for social strife, conflict, and human immiseration. In the Japanese experience, after 250 plus years of uncontested rule, the Tokugawa shogunate crumbled under its own weight as it became inept, debt-laden, and bankrupt, and no longer able to meet the security challenges of the times particularly when Commodore Perry showed up in Yokohama Harbor with his black ships to demand that the country open to trade and provide coaling stations for American ships on their way to China. The Shogun was unable to repel that invasion and ultimately had to sign unequal treaties with Western imperialists that ceded Japan's sovereignty and ultimately ended the Shogunate as a failed protector. In the American case, we have to start looking at general officers and flag officers as a threat to liberty. The late Colonel David H. Hackworth wrote a great book, About Face, detailing his experience with the inept military bureaucracy during the Vietnam War. Hackworth wrote that anybody above the rank of 06 is a member of what he called the Liars Club, meaning to make it above colonel or navy captain requires touting the party line no matter how absurd or destructive it may be, no matter how many lives or tax dollars it may cost. I think now, after 18 years of constant war following the 9-11 attacks, with ill-defined objectives and what amounts to an unwinnable global campaign against a tactic, coupled with the speed of communications technology and social media, that militaries are much more politicized. What a private or corporal does in Afghanistan or, for example, in a prison for low-level captives in Iraq, reaches headline news almost instantly. Defense secretaries and even presidents may be required to answer for these actions of low-level soldiers in the international spotlight. I would suggest that now even not just flag officers and general officers, but officers of much lower rank have to join the Liars Club in order to rise in that environment. Further, to keep the farce that is the global war of terror afloat, the lies have to go even deeper, convincing the world, particularly taxpayers, that entangling alliances and expensive globalist institutions are necessary for international stability also requires a thick tapestry of lies. The web of deceit is much more tangled now in the post-9-11 era and needs to be in the Internet age where near-instantaneous fact-checking is possible. So officers need to toe the line in order to make rank and elevate their status. However, the problems are even more deeply rooted by way of conditioning. To reach that level in the first place, they are institutionalized over a career to look first toward following regulations and complying with directives rather than making logical decisions. They become first and foremost bureaucrats rather than professional warriors. What gets lost in all that is consumer demand and the actions that are actually good for the people that they are supposedly protecting. Bureaucracies, by their very nature, invariably transform from serving the purpose for which they were created into an organization primarily interested in perpetuating its own institutional imperatives, which always include more financial resources and authority. And make no mistake, the Department of Defense and the military services are first and foremost bureaucratic organizations. Ludwig von Mises's outstanding book on bureaucracy provides the right analytical tools to understand the nature of these bastions of socialism and their effects upon society. The interests of the bureaucracy becomes more important than the purpose for which they were established because they are not guided by the price mechanism, consumer demand, or disciplined by market forces. They have to look to artificial signals to guide their actions. Again, regulations and directives, as well as how the political winds are blowing, become more important to military bureaucrats than the actual purpose of providing security. And because tax funding means a steady stream of revenue to sustain their operations, they have no interest in being efficient or directing resources to their highest valued ends. 
For bureaucrats, the money just shows up every two weeks, so there's no incentive to condition their behavior or their expenditures in a way that will satisfy consumer demand with efficiency. McRaven went to college with the ROTC program and became a Navy SEAL soon after commissioning. He served with the counterterrorism unit SEAL Team 6, but was driven out by the founding commander, Dick Marcinko, who said although McRaven was bright, he was too rigid, conventional, and took the special out of special ops. Marcinko, of course, wound up having his own problems with abusing the tax dollars entrusted to him. He would go to prison immediately after retiring for embezzling funds through contract fraud with equipment vendors. In essence, he was getting kickbacks for lucrative contracts channeled toward vendors he had made special arrangements with. This is just one of many privileges military bureaucrats enjoy while influencing the contracting process. I know from my own experience within the military-industrial congressional complex how to write a request for proposals in such a way that only a preferred vendor will get the contract despite all the nonsensical bidding regulations made in the name of fairness. Although those regulations should be viewed as an unnecessary deadweight loss to the tax-paying consumer of these national defense services. Still, McRaven's statements speak for themselves. He, along with several other retired general officers, have advocated for federal gun control measures. Taking from a February 2018 article on Vox, Retired General Martin Dempsey and Admiral McRaven tweeted support for the students agitating for stricter gun control measures following the attack at Florida's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Retired General and former CIA Director David Petraeus co-created a gun control advocacy group aligned with former Democrat politician Gabby Giffords called Veterans Coalition for Common Sense in 2016. Another 20-year Marine veteran named Joe Flensler, associated with Vets for Gun Reform, claimed in the same article that civilians shouldn't necessarily be entitled to own and operate military-grade weaponry. This is where we see how an unofficial caste system is being imposed in a society where the rule of law was intended to be universally applied to everyone under a contractual agreement known as the Constitution. No one was supposed to be above the law, and the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Yet here we see an expectation that certain kinds of weaponry are supposedly reserved to the exclusive use of the standing military bureaucracies. This is not how it was supposed to be. The Constitution clearly states that the militia, composed of the whole body of the people except for a few public officials, are responsible for executing the law, repelling invasions, and suppressing insurrections. For this reason, Congress has the duty of arming, organizing, and disciplining these necessary civic institutions for service to the Union. This is the real reason the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So what kind of arms? Well, it's those suitable for executing the law, repelling invasions, and suppressing insurrections. There is no such thing as a military-grade weapon in the Constitution. Militaries existed at the time the Constitution was being drafted, and a permanent military bureaucracy was rightly considered antithetical to liberty, even by those enamored with conventional European model military organizations, like George Washington. More on that in a moment. For now, I'd like to tell you that with all of the nonsense, propaganda, and deliberate deception being bandied about on social media, in the news, and most likely with lots of people you interact with, it is highly important that you take time out every day to clear your head and get centered. There is a reason that the samurai gravitated towards Zen meditation to deal with the chaos of battle and the principles of war remain in our day and age. Sun Tzu had it right even 2,500 years ago. All war is based on deception, and politics is war by other means, to paraphrase von Clausewitz. Being able to see things clearly is essential for the modern-day warrior. So, what's your technique? How do you develop your higher faculties of mind and perception? The solution also remains as it was during the samurai era, training the mind through deliberate practice. Yet you and I do not have to sit for hours navel-gazing when we can leverage advanced technologies to get all the benefits of deep Zen meditation in as little as 12 minutes. That's right, with the Zen 12 meditation program, you can meditate like a skilled monk in just 12 minutes. This is the way to activate your highest mental capacities so you can stay focused in every situation you encounter. Check out everydaysamurai.life forward slash zen12 today. Right now, you can get a full power yet free sample of this amazing brainwave entrainment technology when you go to everydaysamurai.life forward slash zen12. That's everydaysamurai.life forward slash zen12. 
It's the best way I've found to increase clarity, relieve stress, enhance creativity, and improve overall health. With the Zen 12 meditation program, you can get all of it with just some headphones and the press of a button. That's everydaysamurai.life forward slash zen12. Get your free sample today and start mastering your mind. Okay, former State Department Foreign Service Officer Peter Van Buren wrote that McRaven was essentially calling for a coup to take down the elected president of the United States because of the disruptions being caused to the deep state. Van Buren wrote, Sure, McRaven is not ordering SEAL Team 6 into action today, but go ahead, convince yourself he isn't laying the groundwork, or at least trying to remind people he could. The frightening thing is McRaven's literal call to arms does not occur in a vacuum. McRaven feels that the nation might need to call on its military to intervene. Don't dismiss his op-ed too quickly. Consider it instead timely. Timely indeed, considering also how poor the state of Democratic Party contenders are for the 2020 presidential election. The desperation of the left is thoroughly palpable, and the potential for a charismatic, decorated war hero, thoroughly aligned with the deep state and globalist institutions like the Council on Foreign Relations to emerge as a dark horse savior is well within the realm of possibility. McRaven would likely welcome the call to bring order to the weak and chaotic field of challengers to the current administration, hearkening back to a retired General George Washington returning to serve as the first president and lend his credibility to the newly formed republic. These guys live for such occasions to rise to, and it's their sole claim to fame. Retired General Stanley McChrystal is another career bureaucrat looking to subvert the Constitution. He penned an opinion piece for the New York Times in 2016 stating that home should not be a war zone and called for greater gun control, even going so far to employ other veterans to join the Gabby Giffords Veterans Coalition for Common Sense. He saw no irony in asking other veterans to join his campaign, even while citing the Constitution and the Second Amendment. This is why the ability to see through propaganda and deception is so important. The institutions most looked at to uphold the Constitution are best positioned to undermine it. McChrystal and McRaven are case in point. They swore their oaths to uphold the Constitution and despite the plain language of the Second Amendment that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, here we have them agitating to do exactly that. They are willing to use whatever gravitas heaped upon them by the unwitting public propagandized through mass media, public schooling, and official proclamations, to believe that they are beyond reproach in order to convince the public that giving up liberty will somehow provide security. Of course, home should not be a war zone, yet subverting the republic where only a few delegated functions of mutual concern are entrusted to government for the mob rule of democracy makes ever-increasing conflict and de-civilization inevitable. See Professor Hans Hermann Hoppe's seminal book, Democracy, the God that Failed, for an elucidation of how democracy is but a retarded variant of communism. The analytical tools of political economy are the best way to cut through this delusion, the most important of which is to examine incentive structures. In the case of a permanent, tax-funded bureaucracy, the incentives to abuse resources are overwhelming. Sure, civilization and societies need protection. Security is the sole purpose for enacting government in the first place, according to John Locke. Yet, absent market competition and the need to satisfy customer demand, bureaucracies notoriously squander whatever is given to them. And in the military sense, this includes lives as well as equipment and money. General officers and flag officers are conditioned over their entire adult lives to expect money, status, and resources to just come to them. It starts when they enter college. For McRaven, he rode the ROTC scholarship through college and into his commission. For McChrystal and other military academy graduates, they start collecting a stipend as soon as they enter university. And the paychecks just keep rolling in until they retire, regardless of performance. By the time they retire, they are accustomed to having entire staffs, drivers, cooks, secretaries, schedulers, and note-takers stepping and fetching for them. They have private jets at their disposal and are frequently wined and dined by industry, civic groups, and multinational organizations. They travel in style and get paid for it, which carries with it another unique incentive prone to abuse. Take, for instance, Kip Ward, the first commander of U.S. Africa Command. 
headquartered in Stuttgart, Germany of all places, and established in 2008. Ward would schedule a meeting at the Pentagon on a Friday afternoon to justify taking the Gulfstream executive jet across the Atlantic, just to drive up to New York with his wife over the weekend and enjoy some Broadway shows before flying back Sunday night. Ward ultimately got busted for using his position to enjoy a lavish lifestyle and was demoted from four stars down to three and still wound up with a $200,000 per year pension. This is just one example, yet it illustrates the self-aggrandizing mentality these supposed civil servants wind up with. Remember, McChrystal got fired from his job in Afghanistan by speaking ill of then-President Obama and Vice President Joe Biden in front of reporter Michael Hastings. This bragging eventually made its way into Hastings' book, The Operators, that turned into a movie with Brad Pitt showing the absurdity of the war in Afghanistan. Having been there and being blown up supporting ground combat operations in Afghanistan, I recommend you watch the Vice documentary from back when Vice was cutting edge and not the socialist propaganda outlet it is now, titled This Is What Winning Looks Like. It shows just how much of a waste of time, money, and lives the Afghan campaign is. Watch it and you'll understand how the Liars Club works. Yet these generals and admirals have had to play it straight and pretend like the war on terror was something real, and actually in the service to the security of the United States, when in fact, after 18 years, no military objective has been achieved, and anyone looking clearly at the issue can see that there is not any military solution available to the problems found there. The forever war has only turned into a major cash cow. This is not only for the military bureaucracy, not only for these admirals and generals that have made their careers saying, if you just give us more money, more manpower, more authority, and more equipment, we can keep the fight going. And somehow, it's necessary to protect the homeland to be deployed overseas, engaged in a global campaign, trampling over every other country's sovereignty in order to secure the sovereignty of the United States. Of course, there's a major military-industrial congressional complex that wants to keep this thing going, and is willing to say whatever is necessary to keep the gravy train rolling. This harkens back to the original strategy manual that everyone should consult which is Sun Tzu's The Art of War, or Sun Shi in Japanese, which begins with, All war is based on deception. We can couple this with Karl von Clausewitz's book, Vom Krieg, or On War, which clearly indicates that war is politics by other means. Politics and war are functional equivalents. Therefore, all politics is based on deception. Politics, when observed through the lens of political economy, is also a subsistence strategy or a way of making a living through coercion. Contrast this with the economic means by which we trade with one another, produce value, and exchange on a voluntary basis. This is what creates wealth or human well-being. Economic transactions contribute to human flourishing because each party to the trade voluntarily gives what they have in order to get what they want. In economic means, people have to find agreement with other human beings. Economic means to create wealth or to create a livelihood actually enhances human well-being, whereas political means are a zero-sum game. The winner takes all because there are no voluntary transactions taking place. It's coerced. That is the nature of politics. Politics is the use of coercion in human relationships. This is not to say that I'm against politics across the board. I think Politics are inevitable in human relationships. All human societies need to have some form of coercive function to constrain antisocial behavior and to prevent human violations of proper human conduct. This is in the pursuit of justice. Justice, however, can be easily summed up in just two statements summarizing natural or scientifically derived law. Do all you have agreed to do and do not encroach upon other people or their property. With that, we have the basis for a contract and criminal law. So law is very simple when strictly in pursuit of justice. It's the organization of law as the collective means of self-defense inherent to each individual. The question then becomes how do people as a society come together to nurture and cultivate justice? This collective orchestration of law is what traditionally is called government. And again, I believe it is both necessary and inevitable that people living among one another will organize a system of normalizing behavior so that they can be secure from external invasion and to have some form of settling disputes. While government may be necessary, when we look at things through the lens of political economy, we want to find the most efficient means of organizing those political functions and apply resources to this pursuit in their highest valued ends for the consumer, meaning the people themselves. 
The United States Constitution, flawed or even failed as it might be in the ultimate sense, was designed in pursuit of a more perfect union. How can free and independent states cooperate with one another to assist in their mutual security? The founders knew that a permanent bureaucracy, a standing army, was antithetical to human flourishing, to liberty, to free choice. They also knew that war is the mother of all taxation. Taxation is robbery. It is a forcible taking. It is the holding of a gun up to the taxpayer and saying, pay up or else. And I was a police officer. I studied law. I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. I know what the law says. Theft is the taking of another's property without their consent, with the intent of denying them the value thereof. When force or the threat of force is added to the taking or denying, it becomes robbery by definition. Taxation, therefore, is robbery because there is the threat of or actual use of force in the taking. This is one of the major flaws in the U.S. Constitution. By granting the general government the authority to collect taxes to fund its delegated functions over time and with lots of propaganda, everything gets turned into an excuse to further expropriate the property of taxpayers. Some might say that this type of funding mechanism is necessary for times of crisis or that not enough security would be produced absent the power to tax. We can examine that at another time. Yet what we do know is that the founders of the United States knew that a permanent war footing would deplete the people of their resources. Again, war is the mother of all taxation, and the executive, as James Madison wrote, is the most inclined toward agitating for war, because it tends to centralize power. As good political economists, we have to always equate power with the exercise of control over resources, meaning money, equipment, and people. The president, as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, is the top general, the one most able to exercise power in war. This is why the authority to declare war was vested in the Congress. It is also why the Constitution only allowed for funding an army for two years at a time. Under such a system, there should never be a general with 30-plus years in the same army. An entrenched military bureaucracy is precisely what the framers of the American Republic were seeking to prevent. Yet the military bureaucracy has perpetually grown since 1947. It has become Leviathan, a giant consumption machine that takes and takes from the United States taxpayer, and one has to really ask if they are getting any real return on their investment of security dollars. The strategy for the United States' global war of terror is to fight the terrorists, quote-unquote, over there so that we don't have to fight them over here. Yet ask yourself if the money being funneled into the military-industrial congressional complex is a choice that you freely made, or if your parents, grandparents, uncles, and relatives would rather fund this giant bureaucracy with its expenditure on equipment and programs, even diverting funds to things like monitoring whale migrations like they did with submarines in the 90s, or would they rather have a higher standard of living for themselves and the things they care about? We were supposed to get a peace dividend when the Soviet Union fell. Instead, like an attic, the money had to keep flowing to the military establishment. And for that, they had to find a new bad guy. They had to find some new reason to keep spending on national security, far outside the jurisdiction of the United States. And remember, all of it is being taken from your livelihood, from your sustenance, even if you don't see it because of automatic payroll tax deduction. Thanks a lot, Milton Friedman. And these generals and admirals that grow up in the system and have massive power to impose their will on people within the theaters they command start to look at the homeland, the American people, like cattle, even while they pay lip service to the Constitution and protecting American freedoms. They might know their oath by heart, but they have no consideration for how the Constitution was designed and how it was supposed to function as the instrument of justice, protecting liberty. I personally have been in the room on multiple occasions where general officers have asked what measures of, quote, population control, close quote, were being taken while offering training in third world countries the United States had not even declared war on. It is truly bone chilling to hear a general or flag officer talk about population controls, even though it may apply to the third world, because the mentality returns to the United States when these high level career bureaucrats return to civilian life. Remember, it is always high-ranking and well-respected military leaders that establish dictatorships. The Roman Republic we mentioned earlier was subjugated when Julius Caesar marched his army home after foreign conquest. In England, Oliver Cromwell returned from campaigns in Ireland and Scotland in 1653 to rule with a brutal iron fist as Lord Protector, 
with only a bare-bones parliament to rubber-stamp his will until his death in 1858 and the restoration in 1860. In Japan, Minamoto no Yoritomo established the first shogunate in Kamakura until it collapsed in 1333, followed by Ashikaga Takauji with the Muromachi shogunate until it collapsed in the mid-1400s. And Tokugawa Ieyasu locked down the land of the rising sun until the United States sent Commodore Perry's black ships to crack open the country with cannon fire in 1853. It's always military leaders that set up dictatorships. Take note that the age of imperialism for the United States began well before the so-called Civil War of 1861 to 1865, where all notions of voluntary union were destroyed, and before the 1893 coup d'etat to overthrow the Hawaiian Kingdom, and also before the Spanish-American War gave the United States its first colonies, those being Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Look at the common thread in all these historical examples. It is the return of military leaders from brutal campaigns, having commanded absolute obedience from their troops and committed untold atrocities abroad, that leads to the subjugation of their fellow citizens. These people are used to getting what they want and are accustomed to treat people like pawns to be sacrificed. They must have some degree of psychopathy to, at least temporarily, shut off all sympathy for human suffering or send their own troops on suicide missions. The defense of a free society was not supposed to be dependent upon a permanent bureaucracy or a standing army. It is very clear when you read the Constitution or the writings of the Founders, most especially the ratification debates in the various states, that no other institution is deemed necessary other than the militia. We can understand the thinking at the time by reading the Virginia Constitution. This verbiage was modified slightly and adopted as the Second Amendment, yet this is the original meaning. Quote, that a well-regulated militia, composed of the body of the people, trained to arms, is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state. Therefore, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That standing armies in times of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty, and that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Close quote. Reading this, you can realize what the people who formed the United States were thinking even after they had just won a war that required them to have an army in order to shrug off the British Empire. Even a conventional general like George Washington, who did not think highly of militia, he considered them undisciplined and unreliable in battle. He wanted to have armies that would stand across open fields and shoot at each other in the honorably moronic European fashion, after all. Meanwhile, militiamen were fighting for the freedom to live and prosper, and therefore preferred sniping officers from behind trees or conducting dishonorable hit-and-run ambushes. Yet even he endorsed the militia system over a standing army in the Constitution. When the functions of government are properly restrained to the simple and scientific rules of universal and natural justice, any law worth executing can be handled by the militia. When you have public officials that are equally held to the standard of doing all they have agreed to do and not encroaching upon other people or their property, you don't need a large army of bureaucrats. When you restrain government from engaging in an interventionist foreign policy, you do not provoke enmity and blowback. Therefore, the burden upon the people as militia to repel invasions is relatively light. This is why the founders of the United States advocated for peaceful trade with all and entangling alliances with none. It is preferable to not have to keep looking over your shoulder with a guilty conscience because you are not engaged in nefarious activities. That sounds like a pretty good honor code for people and nations. Now, as martial artists and political economists, we know that one must always have awareness of threats and always be ready to engage in close combat when such action is warranted. This is why we train every day. The United States as a political body is no exception. This is why Congress was tasked in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 16 to arm, organize, and discipline the militia for service to the Union. In other words, rather than restricting the right to keep and bear arms, the general government should be pushing more weapons and training into the hands of every able-bodied citizen. Rather than distracting people with wasteful sports like baseball, basketball, football, etc., all of which, by the way, were introduced to the United States after the Civil War, when the central government needed to distract the population from their militia duties. The general government should be incentivizing shooting, martial arts, 
field medicine, and land navigation activities. I'll also refer back to Mary Ruhr in her outstanding libertarian book, Healing Our World in an Age of Aggression, where she advocates for a militia-type Olympics. And again, the activities there would be related to militia service, shooting, martial arts, the ability to make arrests, team tactics, dynamic entries, and other security-related functions. It is quite telling, then, that the general government neglects the things it is constitutionally tasked with doing, while also infringing in those areas that it is specifically prohibited from. And oathbreakers such as McChrystal, McRaven, Petraeus, Penzler, and Dempsey are cheerleading the descent into tyranny. That is why it is so essential that everyone take their own martial training, including a mindfulness practice, seriously as a way of life. A population trained to arms and equipped with whatever arms are suitable for executing the laws, repelling invasions, and suppressing insurrections is necessary to the security of a free state. This remains the supreme law of the land, and this is also the answer to anyone who claims military-style weapons do not belong in the hands of civilians. Nonsense. This is deliberate deception, and it is time to cut through such delusion with the simple truth clearly stated in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15. And to anyone saying that we no longer have well-regulated militia or do not need them because of the permanent military bureaucracy, you can say that it only evidences the need even more. A standing army and the flag officers that helm them remain antithetical to the security of a free state. It is time to stand down these bureaucracies and restore the decentralized constitutional institutions of local self-government. Friends, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Everyday Samurai, and look forward to seeing you next time. Be sure to subscribe to our feed to stay up to date with our latest offerings. If you like what you've heard here, I'd really appreciate you sharing it with a friend or someone you think would resonate with our message. Please give us a like and share on the social media of your choice, and offer a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts. It really helps build the movement that can restore the security of a free state protected by enlightened warriors in service to liberty and human flourishing. This, again, is our purpose at Everyday Samurai, and it all depends upon your commitment to the warrior path. It begins in mind and the adoption of the attitude that says, I take 100% responsibility for my experience. I am responsible for me, and I rise above the din of confusion to see with clarity, uphold principles, and create so much good in my world that I always have enough surplus to positively contribute to a better world for everyone around me. Your commitment to a mindfulness practice is essential to bringing your highest faculties online so you can perform your best at all you do, and Zen 12 can help you maximize the results. So check out everydaysamurai.life forward slash Zen 12. That's everydaysamurai.life forward slash Zen 12 today. And finally, we've got some pretty cool new things in the shop for you to get, including t-shirts, coffee mugs, tactical pens, and even more. So in your internet surfing, go on over to shop.everydaysamurai.life. That's shop.everydaysamurai.life. Until next time, stay sharp, stay aware, and be well. Be well.